Hi, Sarah. Can you hear me okay? I can. How are you, Becca? Good. Good to I can hear you perfectly. Oh, great. Um, I just wanted to join in plenty of time, so yeah. I'll probably just okay. go on mute and hang out here for a bit. That sounds good. I'm going to mess with a few settings as well. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you. Hi, Cameron. Can you hear me okay? Sorry about that. Can you hear me all right now? <laughs> yep, I can. Thank you. All right. I thought I joined with audio, but it muted no me. I can hear you loud and clear. All good. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to step out for just a second. So if you uh, ask me a question, I may not respond. I'll let you know as soon as I get back. Thanks, Cameron. Sounds good. Um, for those of you that have joined us for the open house, you're in the right place. Thanks for being here. We're going to start promptly um, at noon. We're just making sure our team is, is set up on our end. So thanks for your patience. Hi, Katie. Can you hear me? 
I sure can. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Wonderful. Hi, Bob. This is Becca. Can you hear me okay? I can, Becca. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Thank you. And for those of you that have hopped on, um, we're going to wait until noon or maybe a minute after to let folks hop on the call. So thanks for your patience.
Hi, Scott. This is Becca. Can you hear me okay? Yep. How about me? Everything yep. working? Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Hey everybody, for those of you that have popped on, thanks for being here. We're gonna start maybe a minute or two after 12, just to make sure folks can hop on um, if they're coming from another meeting. Uh, thanks everyone for your patience. We'll get going in just a few minutes. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I know we've hit noon here. Um, we're going to wait a minute, maybe two minutes and dive in. I want to be respectful of everyone's time, but also realize folks might be coming from a different meeting. Um, so we'll give everyone another minute or two to hop on. Thanks for your patience. Appreciate it.
Okay, as the clock strikes 12.02, um, I, again, I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you so much for being here. I'm sure folks will hop on, uh, but we will get rolling here with our presentation. Um, so welcome everyone to the Lolo to Florence US 93 Corridor Study Open House. Uh, my name is Becca McLean. I am the project's communications manager. If we have not connected before, nice to meet you. Um, here today on the call, we have members of the RPA and Montana Department of Transportation project team, um, including Sarah Nikolai and Scott Randall with RPA, Cameron Clobberdans and Bob Bozen with MDT are on the line as well. Um, so these team members are here to answer questions. Um, and first, before doing so, we want to walk through an update on where we're at currently with the study with this project. Um, my colleague Katie is also on the call. She, at the end of this brief presentation, will help facilitate a question and answer session. Um, if you have a question at any time now or throughout the presentation or after the presentation, please feel welcome to write it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And to clarify, this is the Q&A box, not the chat box. Um, and we will address it, the project team rather, will address it at the end of this brief presentation. Um, so we look forward to answering your questions once we get to that point. So bear with us as we walk through um, a few updates for you. And thanks again for your time. Just to touch briefly on what we're going to be chatting through this afternoon, um, here is an agenda outline for our meeting. We're going to chat through details of the study, um, the location of the study area, some key findings at this point, and what next steps look like for public involvement. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Mr. Bob Vozen to chat with you about Vision Zero. Bob? Thanks, Becca, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I appreciate everybody uh, taking time out of your busy day, and uh, we have a, a great attendance here today. I'm glad we're able to uh, provide this opportunity. The the uh, virtual opportunity allows some people that maybe can't make to our in-person uh, meetings as well. So uh, something that that we are going to continue to do is have these virtual opportunities. So. Um, first off, I want to talk about Vision Zero, and it, it really pertains uh, to this project. Uh, Vision Zero is MDT's, um, it's a multi-pronged initiative that MDT started several years ago. The ultimate goal is eliminating deaths and injuries on Montana's highways. Um, without having good roads, bridges, intersections, it makes traveling safely and efficiently through Montana very difficult. And having good roads, bridges, and the rest of our transportation system involves also educating drivers how to use them. It, that's a critical component to building a strong state and strong communities. Um, as you see on the slide in front of you here, there's uh, the four prongs of the, uh, the initiative are education, enforcement, engineering, and emergency medical response. And all of these elements are crucial to help uh, ensure that our roadways are as safe as possible. And so MDT asked drivers to do their part um, by slowing down, uh, pay attention, don't drive impaired, wear your seatbelt, and really critical that we're seeing a lot of need to improve with is the uh, distracted driving, texting and driving. Um, you know, I encourage everyone to utilize one of the apps available for your phone that basically turns it off while it's, while you're driving. It uh, can really greatly improve the safety of our roadways. Um, and as I said, this, this roadway is uh, obviously a highly traveled roadway uh, in Western Montana, connecting the Bitterroot Valley to Missoula. Um, so this project must align with our Vision Zero goal. And uh, we, we strongly believe that this is a, this study is a, a key step in helping us to achieve that goal. Uh, next slide, please, Becca. <clears throat> so a little bit of background on the, the study. Um, you know, we understand this uh, corridor is near and dear to many. And in fact, my wife's family uh, lives up and down the corridor. So I, I've been traveling it uh, since before the study began, it looks like. Um, so uh, we know that 
residents and commuters alike would really like to see some improvements. And um, I'm sure we're all well aware of the traffic volumes have increased throughout Missoula, Western Montana, and in the Bitterroot area. And there, there are needs for roadway improvements. Um, as you can see on the slide in front of you, in 2008, there was a study that took place, the US 93 corridor study from Missoula to Florence. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, some uh, spot, it identified spot improvements and some multimodal options, enhancements um, that we could uh, utilize to address the future transportation needs. Um, some of these were implemented and others, uh, others of those uh, suggestions and improvements uh, were tabled until additional resources and funding could be secured and uh, now time has passed and MDT we're returning to determine a solution. We'll see if some of those remaining um, ideas are still valid or what, what we need to do to uh, improve the area for the years to come. And also on the slide in front of you in 2020, uh, well, in 20, 2007 and 2013, uh, pavement preservation projects were completed in the area just to keep the asphalt roadways in, in good condition. And in 2020, uh, the US 93 South Safety Improvement Study was done. And that was a study that looked at some short term improvements for six key intersections. And now uh, MDT has enlisted RPA to assist us to determine some long-term improvements. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah with RPA to uh, get into the specifics of the study. Sarah. Thanks Bob and hello everyone. I'm Sarah Nikolai, project manager with Robert Hutch and Associates. And we just wanted to revisit the project location for those of you that might not be familiar. So as Bob and Becca mentioned, um, with this study, we're looking at US 93 between Lolo to Florence. And so this segment of US 93 will be the focus of our efforts. Um, you might be aware of some other studies that are taking place in the area. Bob touched on some of the past work that's been done. Um, this map indicates some of the current efforts. So right now, MDT is conducting a speed study between Missoula and Hamilton, and that's shown in orange on this map. And then MDT is also um, pursuing a mill and fill construction project between Lolo and Missoula, and um, that's shown in purple on the map. And that will be constructed in 2026 or potentially sooner if funding becomes available. So these two efforts are separate from our study, but we just wanted to note them to avoid any confusion. So next I'll talk about some of the details of our study. And as, as Bob mentioned, um, in terms of those four components of Vision Zero, this study is really part of MDT's contribution toward that um, on the engineering side. And so with our study, we're conducting traffic analysis, crash data review, field observations, environmental evaluations, and a review of the base roadway conditions. And additionally, we're looking at pedestrian and cyclist considerations. And of course, feedback from stakeholder meetings and local businesses and residents will be a really important part of the study. And then lastly, we'll be reviewing and identifying potential grant opportunities to help MDT fund improvements in the corridor. This is a really important piece. As Bob mentioned back in 2008, some of the ideas um, that were proposed at that time couldn't be funded. And so we're really hoping that the ideas that come forward from this study, we can identify some specific grant opportunities and other funding um, possibilities to help help these solutions move forward and be implemented. So I wanted to share a few of our key findings to date. Um, we've, we've done a, a safety trend analysis looking at data from the years 2016 to 2020. And during that time period, there were 198 reported crashes. Um, so this equates to about 40 crashes per year. And of those reported crashes during that time period, two resulted in fatalities, and 55% of all of those crashes were animal related. 42% um, of the crashes occurred at night when there was no street lighting. And we recognize certainly that these numbers don't reflect the near miss experiences that you might have had or even incidents that have occurred since 2020. Um, but it just gives us a snapshot of some of the safety concerns that have been observed in the corridor. Uh, as Bob mentioned, we know that, that traffic is, is growing, volumes are really growing, and it's heavier the closer you get to Missoula. 
Based on our review of the morning and evening peak travel periods, we found a large range of travel speeds. Um, people, um, some people driving at the speed limit, some people driving over and some below. Uh, we also noticed that sight distance is, is a concern at some of the intersections in the corridor. And um, we've heard from a number of folks that it's, it's pretty hard for drivers on those approach streets or the minor streets to make left turn movements onto the highway. Um, we've also heard from folks that sometimes turning right from Highway 93 onto those minor approaches can be difficult just due to the speeds of the following vehicles that are coming up behind you. So um, a number of concerns that we've heard kind of some of the common themes from our stakeholder meetings to date. Additionally, we've heard that the location of the shared use path can cause some conflicts um, between all the users of the corridor, vehicles that are turning either onto the, the highway or from the highway, the cyclists and the pedestrians then using that path, and there could be some conflict points in those locations. We're also taking a close look at environmental conditions in the corridor, so including things like wetland areas and wildlife movement and habitat in the area. And you might be familiar that there have been a couple of recent grizzly bear um, sightings, and in particular, two grizzly bears that crossed US 93 near about milepost 80 in early August. Um, we've, we also know that elk are frequently spotted in the corridor, um, so a lot of wildlife considerations. Um, this study will be documenting the known usage and will try to identify ways to minimize conflicts between wildlife and vehicles in the corridor. Um, we were concerned about this from a couple of perspectives. We, uh, of course, want to minimize um, any safety concerns from the human perspective, property damage perspective, and the wildlife perspective um, in terms of mortality and, and connecting those species. So this information is just a snapshot of the work that we've been doing. Um, we've included some of our photos and observations on these slides, but if you'd like more details as we progress, we're happy to share those with you either offline or as Becca mentioned, we'll be answering questions after our presentation. I also wanted to touch on the timeline of the study. So as indicated here, the study will take place this year and into next year, 2023. We're expecting that we'll have results available late next year or possibly by early 2024. Uh, design and construction is unknown at this time. And as we've mentioned before, it's, it's really dependent on the funding availability and, and what funding sources that we can uh, identify for this study. So with that, I will pass it back to Becca. Fabulous. Thank you, Bob and Sarah, and thanks everyone for listening in for some background on the study. Um, a really key factor to this project, as mentioned, is hearing from the public about experiences everyone is having in the corridor. Um, we have met with a handful of stakeholders, um, businesses, residents already, and will continue to do so in the coming months. Um, as mentioned, members of the project team are here to take any questions, comments, feedback um, you might have about the project. Um, we're still in a continual state of um, receiving feedback. So you're certainly welcome to um, just submit thoughts either via this Q&A or to my email um, as well, in addition to questions. Um, you're welcome to visit the project webpage listed here on the screen. This will be frequently updated as the study progresses. There's also a phone number if you're interested in sending questions or feedback via phone as well. Um, and again, just lastly, um, noting that my email is listed there. If you have not um, contacted me via email, we will be um, making sure that email updates are sent as well. So feel free. I will, I'll pause on this screen for a moment here so folks can write this down. I also want to mention before we jump into our Q&A, um, there is an in-person open house tonight from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. at Lolo School in the lower gym. Um, if you are interested in chatting in person or have additional questions after attending today's virtual open house, you are more than welcome to come to that. Um, the same content will be discussed and covered, so you're certainly not going to miss anything. Um, but also, if you have a neighbor that maybe missed this virtual meeting but's interested in learning more, please direct them to come to the in-person open house this afternoon, and we would love to see them. Um, with that, I will 
pass us into the Q&A. Again, the team is here and ready to answer questions. So if you have a question or a comment or a piece of feedback, we encourage you to type it into the Q&A box and my colleague Katie will help us facilitate and direct those to a project team member to answer. Um, so with that, I will pause. Um, Katie, do we have any questions in the Q&A box at the moment? Hi, Becca, thank you. We do not. So folks, after listening to our presentation, if you have any questions or information that you'd maybe like us to zoom in on, as Sarah was saying, there's a lot more. We're happy to answer any of those questions you might have, or if you just want to leave a comment, please add that to that Q&A screen at the bottom. It looks like two different chat bubbles, then we'll be able to read those out and direct them to the rest of the project team to be able to fully answer. And so with that, I just got one. Thank you, Joshua. So Sarah, I'm going to throw this over to you first. So Joshua is asking, do you know how many of the roughly, <clears throat> excuse me, 190 crashes during the study resulted in injury or serious injury? Thanks, Katie. Um, let me let me take a look as we're talking here. Um, we do have that data and um, my colleague Scott is also on the line. So let us take a quick minute um, to look that up and then we can respond to how many of those crashes resulted in injury or severe injury? Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. I have, I have the data here with me. Um, I can run through it real quick. So out of the 198 crashes, we had two that resulted in a fatality, um, five that resulted in a suspected serious injury, and um, it looks like 14 resulted in possible injury and 21 suspected minor injury. So overall about 78%, 155 of those 198 crashes. So 78% resulted in no apparent injury. And then about 1% in uh, fatality and 3% in a suspected serious injury. Thanks, Scott. That's great detail. Joshua, if you have anything else that you would like us to answer, feel free to let us know. Um, and then we can follow up from there. So I also see another one, Sarah, I'll throw this to you again first, wondering if there are any wildlife crossing bridges planned with this project. Thanks, Katie, great question. Um, right now we are just kind of in the early investigative stages of the study. So we're trying to gather existing condition information about what kind of species are using the corridor, where they're crossing, um, where we're seeing conflicts between vehicles and wild animals. Once we have that data, um, and we actually have a, a sub-consultant on board helping us with that, um, Herrera Environmental out of Missoula is, is taking a close look at these issues. They are currently uh, preparing a report. You may have seen them out in the field this summer. We had some folks um, taking a look on the ground at uh, the wildlife conditions and um, wildlife species, and they're now writing their report. They'll share that with us and with MDT. Once we have a better understanding of the existing conditions, then our next step will be to start to look at potential solutions. We will be looking at wildlife accommodations within this corridor, and I think, I think we're open to kind of the, the universe of possibility. Um, however, we understand that you know, there are a number of constraints, um, funding being one of those. Um, some of the, the crossing structures can be um, pretty expensive. We will look at ways to enhance existing crossings. So if there are culverts that can be enlarged um, or other bridges or other structures in the corridor, we certainly would look at that. And I guess I would say wildlife crossings are probably not off the table at this point. Um, we're just taking a look at those possibilities and then we'll be making some accommodations as we move forward with the study. Thanks, Sarah, that's awesome. So next, I'm seeing a couple. Um, first from Helena, wondering if you're considering any noise mitigations generated by the highway use. So over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Katie. Um, great question about noise. So um, MDT kind of has a, a multi-step process and noise is absolutely um, considered in their projects. Um, we're not doing a specific noise study as part of our planning effort right now. Uh, we're, we're trying to better understand the existing conditions and then kind of brainstorm some solutions. If any of those were to advance um, to a project, so let's say MDT were to um, add a turn lane or, or um, add, add some other feature in the corridor, when it becomes a project and it's in the design and construction process, that's when MDT would conduct an actual noise study um, and looking at the use and potential mitigation from any noise impacts. 
that context is really helpful, Sarah. Thank you. I, I know I appreciate that for sure. So Helena, if you have any follow-up, please let us know. Otherwise, going over to Doug, who's wondering if it's possible to reduce the speed limit before the end of the study. And with that, so kind of part one and then part two, do we expect a larger presence of law enforcement before or after the study? So Sarah, I'll turn it over to you and then maybe Bob if needed. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Katie, and thanks, Doug. Um, great question about speed. So um, MDT is actually conducting a speed study currently. Um, so I think we mentioned that on, on one of the earlier slides there from Missoula to Hamilton. So it does incorporate the portion that we are consider con uh, considering with our planning study. And it looks like um, Becca is just switching over to that slide so we can see where that's occurring. So that's happening right now, which is really advantageous and we can take advantage of the results of that speed study and incorporate that then into our planning study. Um, so we're not taking a look at it, but it's being done separately and we can incorporate those results. And then the second part of the question, do we expect a bigger presence of law enforcement? Um, I would say law enforcement is a, a very important component to MDT's Vision Zero initiative. As, as Bob mentioned, they're kind of one of the, the four main pieces. MDT is in constant collaboration with law enforcement. And I, I think, um, you know, there's definitely an awareness of, of speed being a concern in this corridor. And I, I know MDT is, is coordinating closely with law enforcement. Bob, I'm not sure if you have anything else to add on, on the law enforcement side. Uh, uh, thanks, Sarah. And Doug, great questions. Um, I'll address the two parts as well. Um, the first one, is it possible to reduce the speed limit before the end of the study? Um, absolutely. It, it depends on how what the findings of the speed study are. How speed limits are set in Montana is uh, very clearly spelled out in, in state law. And that is uh, the speed studies, the I'm going to call it the second step. The first step is the local governing bodies. In this case, it's actually two different counties that it each requested one. Um, Missoula County requested from Missoula to Lolo and uh, Ravalli re requested from Lolo South, essentially. So we, we had actually ended up with a little bit of a gap, but we're studying the entirety of the area. The results of those studies that are provided back to the entities that request them, the, gover the government bodies, in this case, the counties, um, and then they get a chance to review those studies. After they review them, there they will either concur with the findings of the study or they can um, uh, dispute them and say they want a, a different speed limit set. There's at that point, once the county gets the studies back, there is a a public comment component of that that this, the counties uh, will take on where they'll, uh, the public can review the results of the speed study and submit comments to the county. The county then submits their, uh, their the comments they've received and their additional comments that they have themselves back to the Transportation Commission, which is a, a five member body appointed by the governor and the transportation commission ultimately reviews all the information, the comments, the, they actually can hear testimony from the commissioners or the public and they all will then set the speed limit based on the, all of the data presented to them. So a long winded way to say that it, it's not as simple as uh, MDT feeling like the speed limit should be changed and we go up there and put different signs up. There's a a very detailed process that has to be gone through. Um, that process is already started, as I said, with the study being underway. Once those re the report is done and submitted, uh, the county will get back to us and it is definitely not tied to this study at all. So this study will take the speed into consideration, but we are not, waiting for this study to be complete. If the Transportation Commission goes through the uh, through their process and uh, feels that changes are warranted uh, or no changes are warranted, whatever those decisions are made, they're provided back to MDT and uh, signs are going to be changed uh, in a timely fashion at that point. So the second part of the question that I don't see in front of me. Sorry, I lost it. It was about law enforcement. 
Oh, law, law enforcement. And uh, just a, another little bit of education. Uh, law enforcement is actually under the Department of Justice, not the Department of Transportation. But as Sarah said, they uh, we, we do coordinate with them. Uh, we are in contact with them. Uh, uh, the Highway Patrol is, uh, like everyone else these days, it seems a little short on staff, but um, they, they are cognizant of that there is a, a need for uh, enforcement in the area, but also um, I encourage folks to reach out and as well as to the local sheriff's departments as they also have jurisdiction in the area. So um, enforcement is definitely a good thing and we, we recognize that as it's uh, one of those uh, four components that I discussed earlier. So uh, again, thanks for the great question. Sorry for the long-winded answer, Doug. Thanks for that, Bob. I think that's help, really helpful as well. Let's see, we have a few more coming in. So that's great. And Bob and Sarah, Doug just followed up saying thank you. So I thought, I think we got that answered well, which is great. Um, next, I see three in the queue. And just a reminder, folks, if you can help me by putting that into the Q&A, it's a far easier for us to see rather than the chat. So I just want to make sure that I'm not missing anybody. So with that, moving on to our next question, which is if it's possible that we would see any new improvements, such as a traffic light at an inter problem intersection before the conclusion of the study, if it's deemed particularly pressing. So Sarah, I'll, I'll throw that back to you. Thanks, Kitty, and thanks, Eve. That's a great question as well. Um, so as, as we've mentioned, we've been holding a number of stakeholder meetings um, with folks in the corridor, and, and this is a concern that we've heard a couple of times, that there's um, really a feeling of need um, that's pressing in the corridor, that people would really like to see some improvements as soon as possible. As, as Bob mentioned, so this study is looking kind of uh, using more of a long-term lens to take a look at the corridor. However, MDT is looking um, at some short-term uh, improvements. In 2020, that traffic study that Bob mentioned, that specifically was looking at six study intersections and some potential for short-term improvements um, for this very reason. Uh, just uh, following up on the, the concern that you've raised, Eve, that there are some pressing needs that folks would really like to see addressed. And I, I think MDT is in the process of considering the recommendations from that short-term 2020 study. And it really, I think, comes back to funding. Um, so as soon as funding can be secured, uh, there is an interest in, in pursuing improvements. Um, Bob, I'll toss it back to you as well, just to see if there's any anything further on the short-term side. A uh, great question uh, and uh, also a very good answer. I, I can just add a little bit of additional, um, uh, I don't know, the, the big challenge MDT is facing. I actually went through and looked at all of the projects in Western Montana that have been identified. We've got um, a five-year plan and then additional projects outside the plan. Um, and so we currently do not have a project in this area plan. We recognize safety is a key component. Our, we have a, a highway safety improvement program that is in place. It's one of our uh, funding categories, if you will. And uh, so we're, we're constantly moving projects around and they're based on need and basically where do we get the, the best return on our investment, if you will. And uh, so as, as we identify the projects, one of the things we're looking at is, you know, which one, most of the projects in the area are expensive as is everything these days. So we're trying to figure out how can we best spend the monies we have. Um, our five-year plan, just to give some context to everybody in Western Montana, the Missoula district, we have projects programmed for out five years, um, but with the current funding levels, the projects that we've already identified that we know that we need, um, including some reconstruction projects, some overlays, et cetera, um, if funding levels stay the same, it's going to be into the 2040s before we can complete the projects we have in front of us today. So that that just kind of illustrates the level of challenge. And then when I throw in the other projects that we've identified but have not even begun to work on yet, such as these uh, projects in this area, it just pushes that funding need out even further. Uh, so 
we've got somewhere in the neighborhood of $700 million worth of projects identified for construction in Western Montana. And like I say, it's gonna take us into the 2040s to complete it. So um, not that I'm saying that it's gonna be the 2040s before we get anything done on Highway 93. It's just the challenge is what projects do we push out to move something else in? So it, it's, it's really, a, it's extremely challenging, but we definitely recognize the need uh, for making some improvements in this area. All right, thank you, Bob. Let's see here. We have a couple more. So Joshua is asking a like, really good question. So he's saying, given the amount of traffic that's agricultural and construction related, Sarah, is the study going to be looking at the size and type of the vehicles in addition to the speed and number of vehicles that will be reviewed? Yeah, great question. Thanks, Katie, and thanks, Joshua. Um, you're exactly right, Joshua. We are looking at just that type of data. And for this study, we identified eight study locations. Um, and I'll, I'll just read those out to you so everyone is aware of, of where we were collecting data. So um, starting at the north end of the corridor, Mormon Creek Road, um, the Delarca Drive North and South um, couplet, Rowan Road, Carlton Creek Road, Chief Looking Glass Road, Old US 93, and then Long Avenue. And so at these intersections, um, we were collecting data this summer. We, we set out um, cameras that were taking video recordings of uh, vehicles that were observed during the observation time periods. And once we get those videos, then we send them in for processing. And one of the results that we can take a look at is the vehicle classification, which will tell us the size and type of vehicles that we're seeing. So we can understand how many passenger vehicles versus how many larger trucks versus agriculture use. Um, all of that information will be available to us. So great question. Scott, anything else that you'd like to add from the traffic side? Um, maybe just briefly, I'd mention, you know, one of the other things we're tasked with when we're looking at traffic is not just looking at these spot locations, but also trying to understand the, the whole use of Highway 93. We know that it serves a lot of different purposes, a lot of different users, you know, commuters, um, res local residents, uh, traffic that's just traveling through the area, trying to get, you know, from the southern U.S. up to Canada, or whatever it might be, it's serving a lot of different uses. And so, Part of what we're scoped to do is try to understand what those uses are to, to really evaluate what the needs are and figure out some of these solutions. And, and a big part of that, of course, is commercial vehicles. This is Highway 93 is a very large freight route. You know, it's not just a, a local route for connection to Missoula. It serves a much uh, broader purpose as well. And so trying to understand all that information and um, all these different types of uses and travel patterns are um, important uh, to look at as well. Thanks, Scott. And one question I realized I inadvertently moved to answer that I want to go back to is, is somewhat similar to that in terms of looking at traffic patterns. So Jim has asked to what extent is ongoing and future development being considered in the study? Thanks, Katie. And thanks, Jim. Great question there as well. And we are absolutely taking a look at development in the corridor. It's really important for us to not only understand the existing conditions, but what's planned in the future. And as Scott mentioned, as we're trying to understand um, the, the traffic patterns and traffic volumes throughout the corridor, a, a really important piece of that is um, what kind of growth that we expect. And so we are looking at what kind of development is planned. We've heard from some of our stakeholders and, and folks that we've talked to, for example, that um, there's some new development planned at the Rowan Road intersection. So we're looking at that. We also just um, account for kind of historic growth and, and if we think that that will continue into the future at the same rate. Um, so that is built into our traffic analysis um, as we take a look at those future traffic volumes and try to anticipate what the, the quarter might look like in 20 years in terms of those volumes. Um, we want to make sure that whatever um, proposals that we offer to MDT um, will have some longevity to them and that we can at least um, provide some recommendations that will last out the next 20 years. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so the last question that I am seeing is from Gina, unless I just accidentally talked over somebody. Does anybody have anything else to add on the future growth before I move on? Yeah, okay. 
sorry, I thought I heard somebody in mute. Um, so last but not least, we have Gina asking if we have any preliminary ideas of what are going to be happening within the corridor. And then she's specifically asking um, about on or off ramps and or traffic lights. So Sarah, back to you. Hey, thanks, Katie, and thanks, Gina. Um, so in terms of ideas for solutions, we're not quite there yet. Um, we will be hosting some additional public involvement a little bit later in the study, and at that point, we hope to share some of our, our ideas and recommendations um, for potential solutions in the corridor. And as far as the things that you're mentioning, the on-off ramps, um, that kind of would be uh, a situation you might be thinking of kind of interstate um, facilities where access is controlled. We will definitely be looking at what kind of access control could make sense for this corridor. Um, traffic lights are on the table. We, we absolutely will take a look at that as well. Those eight study intersections that I mentioned, I think we're, we're just trying to identify ways to make um, traffic movements, all traffic movements, both main line and turning movements from those side streets, um, safe and efficient. So we'll be looking at a, a host of potential ideas. And the next time that we come out um, to talk with all of you, we'll have um, some specific ideas to share with you at that time. Thanks, Sarah and Gina just followed up with a thank you. So I, I think we answered those fully. Those are the last of the questions that I am seeing both in the Q&A and the chat. And as I say that, we have another one, which is great. So Jocelyn has asked if the corridor study will include the area behind Florence School. So our study area um, ends just north of Florence um, in our, I guess our beginning project reference point is 75. So it's just north of the connection with 203 there. Um, we have actually um, spoken with um, representatives from the school. So it, it, we, we definitely understand that school traffic is a really important component within this corridor. And we're taking a look at how um, the school traffic impacts um, are, are factored into all of the other traffic volumes that occur. Um, so we will, we will be considering that school traffic as well. I think Sarah, and then one last that I'm seeing. So will Montana Rail Link right of way become available for possible use in conjunction with the highway, such as an express lane? So any thoughts on MRL land? Yeah, thanks, Lena. So um, you're exactly right with the, the railroad paralleling the corridor. It's, it's definitely an important consideration with this study. Although um, the rail line is, is not used real frequently, it is still owned um, and maintained by, by the railway. And um, as far as we're aware, they don't have any plans to abandon that rail line. And so our assumption is that we will need to stay within MD2 right of way or easement um, for any improvements with the study. Hey, Kate, uh, and this is Bob, I can add a little bit do that. Um, and MRL is the tracks are gone. They're not being utilized, but they are not interested in giving up their right of way. They want, they will retain that right of way for future use if they so uh, need. I know there's been, it's been in the news lately that the county has worked with them on removing sections of tracks to be able to lower grades for county crossings and stuff. And um, actually, MBT is uh, going to be having the same discussion at the intersection where you turn onto the east side highway. Uh, maybe we can lower that grade as well. But they're, while they're willing to do that, the, it comes with the caveat that if they need or if they need in the future to redevelop their line, they're going to retain their right of ways for that purpose. So um, MDT obtaining that right away as it currently stands is not an option. Um, and then one other comment or, that I wanted to make, Katie, was in the comment sections, um, Doug had asked a question about uh, the speed limit and the study lower and speed limits. Um, I put a link in there to where folks can uh, track the different speed studies that are being done around Montana. And then scrolling further down in the chat, um, Bonnie asked about the five-year plan, and I put a link in there. We call it the STIP, uh, the State Transportation Improvement Plan, and I put a link into the current STIP that we're operating under, 
uh, that uh, the next annual STIP will be published sometime in, uh, I would suspect sometime in November. Thanks, Bob. Those are really great. And I appreciate you calling everyone's attention to those. So maybe Becca too, when we follow up with this presentation and I, I'm gonna throw it back over to you, Becca. I think we're just about done with questions, but this all of this information will be posted and those might be some good resources to reshare as well, just in case everyone's not seeing them. Um, and you're very welcome, Doug. We're glad that you were able to attend and ask some good questions. We appreciate you being here. With that, Becca, I am not seeing anything else from the good of the order. So, or for the good of the order, excuse me. So I'll turn it back over to you to potentially wrap us up. Sure, thanks Katie, thanks everyone. Those are really productive questions, we appreciate it. Excuse my scroll, I'm just gonna pause again on this slide with my contact information and the webpage if you have not um, written that down and would like to see that information again. Um, we will pause and the project team will stay on the line for a few more minutes here to see if there are any last minute questions or comments or pieces of feedback. Um, and then we'll we'll hop off after that. This is the end of our our um, program, if you will. So feel free to to pop into the Q and A if you have any last questions or thoughts. And the team will hang out for a few more minutes here, um, and then we'll close us out in a minute. Um, so can you let me know if anything pops up in the next minute or two? Okay, thanks, Becca. We did have one. Um, so Sarah and Bob, I think this is for you just to further clarify if there's anything more that we can add regarding timeline. Um, but we do have a question wondering what a realistic timeline might be on anything that's happening if there's anything that's decided to be done. And they're noting here that they would love to see a protected left hand turn lane or something for those going north in the morning. Thanks for that question. I'll, I'll probably defer this one to Bob, except I will just mention that a, an important part of this study is looking at some specific um, funding mechanisms you might be familiar with. Um, some of the recent laws that have been passed at the federal level that have allocated some additional money um, for discretionary grants. And so we'll be looking at those grant programs to see if any improvements that we identify might be good candidates. And if MDT can apply for a grant and secure that money, um, that can be added to the pot and potentially um, accelerate any improvements in the quarter. But as far as kind of the regular core funding, I might defer that one to Bob. Yeah, um, again, great question. One I wish I had a great answer for, but unfortunately I don't. Um, funding is, like I ex described earlier, extremely challenging. Um, have so many needs, pulling the little bit of funding we have in so many different directions. Um, I, I can't give a date uh, or even a year to say expect improvements by such and such date. Uh, I can tell you the likelihood of anything happening in under two years would be extremely unlikely just because of where we are in the, the funding situation right now. Um, you know, the funding for the next two years is pretty well committed. Um, even if we are able to obtain a grant or something that provides additional funding, it still takes time to get project development um, for potentially needing to look at purchasing right away or um, putting the design together. Both of those items takes uh, time. And then uh, from there, it's it just becomes, it's extremely challenging to get something uh, done much sooner than that. So, uh, but this, uh, this, this study will help us in trying to prioritize the needs and also hopefully we can help uh, by having this study, it'll be a great document to utilize as we do apply for um, discretionary funds that are available or grants. Thanks, Bob, and great question. I think it's it's worth noting too that any answers are not intended to necessarily be vague. It's just that this team I know very well does not have the answer. If we had a crystal ball, I think we'd probably be doing something else. It's just really tricky to be able to know exactly how it's all going to shake out, but it doesn't necessarily mean as Bob and Sarah have really strongly stressed that the need isn't recognized or there's an active interest to make a project come online any faster. Um, so with that, I have one more question for you, Sarah, looking at the study area. 
So Joshua followed up wondering if the Rowan intersection would be a candidate for a specific focus of the study. He's recommending but for a potential light, given that it connects the old highway and could be a significant feeder to provide safer access to get northbound. And then with that, he also has a secondary question wondering who specifically requested the study. So over to you, Sarah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Joshua. And yes, uh, the Rowan Road intersection is one of our study intersections. It's a spot where we set out cameras, we've collected data, and we are absolutely looking at potential improvements there. Um, traffic control is, is on the table in terms of um, you know, potential light, as you mentioned, but we might be also looking at other configurations um, to give safe and efficient access onto and from the highway. So um, we'll absolutely consider that Rowan Road intersection. And then your second part of the question, who specifically requested this study? Um, so the MDT district, um, so Bob's Missoula district, um, identified the need for this study. And I, I'll, I'll let Bob speak to that, but I, I believe part of that was just hearing from residents and business owners and landowners in the corridor about the need and the concerns here. Um, and so some of those um, public comments, I think helps for the need for the study. Yeah, that's a great answer, Sarah, and that's exactly right. Um, I attend many public outreach meetings. I, I speak to different groups, and um, through through those different interactions with the public, um, you know, I, I heard uh, heard a lot of desire for improvement. Uh, MDT, I, we we've got a lot of employees that live in the Bitterroot, and as I said. Uh, my wife has a tremendous amount of family. So it, everybody is aware of the challenges in the area. Um, but, uh, you know, in discussions I had with other members of the leadership of MDT, uh, as well as with our safety, traffic and safety group, we decided that uh, rather than just start trying to guess, well, let's start here, let's start there. Let's get this study put together and figure out where we again when you have such a limited amount of money and such a tremendous amount of needs we have to be very cognizant that we're spending the money wisely and correctly and so that's what led to the study that's a really good question joshua and i think really comprehensive from bob and sarah but certainly um, if you have anything following this meeting that pops up after reviewing feel free to let becca know with her contact information listed here and lastly, I might throw this to Scott. Uh, so Jocelyn's followed up asking about the traffic data and wondering if with the information regarding the crashes, if we were able to drill that down to know if they were southbound or northbound primarily. Sarah or Scott, do we happen to know that? Yeah, I'm actually looking at the data right now. If you give me just one second, I should be able to get that information. Scott, and as Scott's pulling that up, Becca, just for you to know as facilitator of this meeting, I don't see any other questions. All right, so I was able to look, look at the data. So we had about 254 vehicles that were involved in crashes. And if we look at the direction of travel of vehicles, it was actually pretty evenly distributed north and south. There was about 50% that were in the southbound direction and 45% in the northbound direction. And then the remaining vehicles would be um, those coming from the side streets going either east or westbound. So a little bit more in the southbound direction, but um, pretty, pretty even distribution as far as just vehicles in direction that they were traveling that were involved in the crash. It doesn't um, necessarily note who was at fault or, or kind of all the details of what was going on, but if we just look at the direction the vehicle is traveling, again, about 50% southbound and 45% northbound. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. Really appreciate that. And Jocelyn followed up saying, gotcha, that's interesting. Thank you. Very interested in seeing how this progresses. So with that, Becca, I will turn it back over to you. I don't see any further questions. Thank you. Sounds good. Bob, did you have another note? I see that you're unmuted. Yeah, I was just going to thank everybody for attending today and for all the great comments. I've, um, I have done a lot of these and this was probably one of the top uh, interactive uh, presentation that we've had. And uh, honestly, I, I just really appreciate all the, the really quality questions helping us. This is 
just this presentation helps us to have a understanding of you know how we can improve doing these in the future and stuff so thanks to everybody attending thanks bob ditto to that thanks everyone for your time today we really appreciate it um, again maybe we'll hang out another 30 seconds or a minute if there are final questions comments feedback for the team um, they will stick around to answer those and then we will wrap up so again we'll we'll pause here for a moment um, feel free to write down my email address if you haven't already um, but if you have no further questions or comments you're welcome to hop off Okay, just double checking nothing's coming through on your end, Katie. That is correct. Okay, fabulous. Um, well, thanks everyone. Again, just second what Bob said, um, really quality and productive questions. I know this has been incredibly valuable for the project team. Um, if you think of anything, feel free to reach out um, and we welcome you to join us this afternoon at the in-person event. So thanks everyone for your time. Have a good rest of your day.